Well, PP, let me remind you that the combined ignorance of you and your prompter does not necessitate the abandonment of fundamental physics in favor of the meandering poetry of Bronze Age desert dwellers. Watery geysers erupting from the south pole of Saturn's moon, Enceladus, suggest that the moon is giving off a great deal of heat. Yet this heat should die down relatively quickly. And while your kind pompously ascribed the matter to Big Brother and his entourage playing celestial ping pong, real scientists were hard at work to find the actual answers. Dr. Jake Abair possesses a PhD in physics from the University of Texas at Dallas. Recently he wrote an article titled Youthful Solar System Bodies Puzzle Evolutionary Scientists. Thus I respectfully suggest that you assume the accustomed position in order to commence with the procedure. Well, PP, I guess you have been sitting a bit fitfully during the last few days, so I moved heaven and earth to squeeze in your appointment. And you will be all the more happy that since our last procedure I have sharpened my lyrical instrument. Thus I suggest that we pull on our gloves and take a look through the rectoscope to remind ourselves of what we are dealing with. The brightness of Saturn's rings is puzzling because after billions of years they should have been darkened by dust from comets and asteroids. Yet these rings are still brilliantly beautiful. I believe to have properly reinserted your pontifications regarding tidal dissipation and thus will proceed in addressing the tiny imprecisions you offered in relation to Saturn's rings and its moon Titan. But before we come to the good stuff, let me make an observation. In the picture that adorns your nauseatingly tedious recitation of the gospel according to Dr. Jake, Saturn's rings are brown. And while this has no factual implication to my refutation, your choice of color to convey beauty might go a long way in explaining your misconception about what orifice to employ in the production of your arguments. This presentation method may impress equally impaired specimens, but rather inconveniently for you, I know shit from Shinola. Saturn's rings are arguably the most recognizable feature in the solar system. In the 19th century, French astrophysicist Edouard Roche proposed that the rings may have been formed when one of Saturn's moons spiraled inward and was torn apart by tidal forces. Others suggested that the rings may be vestiges of the planetary nebula from which Saturn formed. A clue to the mystery may lie in the unique distribution of material in Saturn's rings and satellites. While the rings are almost purely comprised of ice, the mid-sized moons have rocky cores. Even more intriguingly, those moons all share a high albedo icy surface, implying that silicates have been removed from their surfaces and buried in the interiors. Although not directly in response to your faux pas, I will elaborate on the connection of Saturn's rings and moons and present a possible and interesting picture. Consider it the overture to introducing your argument to the clarification plant. 4.5 to 2.5 billion years ago, an ice-rich moon spiraled towards Saturn. As it reached its Roche limit, tidal forces started to overcome the gravitational force that held the moon together. While the ice was shredded to pieces at a distance of 136,000 kilometers, the Roche limit for the dense silicates lies at 90,000 kilometers. Hence large rock boulders remained. Around such a body there is a margin of space where the individual gravity is stronger than that of Saturn. Within these boundaries ice particles accreted, encasing the silicate chunks and forming larger structures. If two such protomoons came too close, they were drawn together. But since they all traveled in the same direction, the collisions would have been gentle allowing the bodies to merge. In only 100,000 years, moons with masses of up to 10 to the power of 21 kilograms were formed, gathering about 99% of the disk's initial mass. According to the principles I presented in Celestial Mechanics 4, torque from Saturn caused the newly formed satellites to migrate outward, 
episodes of large eccentricity might have triggered intense tidal heating, which would explain the visible signs of past geological activity at the surface of Saturn's moons. Based on the present estimates of the meteorite mass flux into the rings, they should absorb about 1 Mimas mass worth of meteorites within 4.5 billion years. For rings with a similar mass as estimated by the Voyager mission, this would have significantly altered the composition and albedo of the rings. More recent measurements however suggest a mass of at least twice that of Mimas, which would allow the rings to better dilute infalling material. Furthermore, Enceladus spreads fresh and bright water ice particles in the inner Saturnian system, which would partially counteract the darkening by meteoric bombardment. If the rings originated from a disintegrating moon, they may indeed be younger than Saturn. Hence considering the age of Saturn's rings as a limiting factor for the age of the universe is tantamount to thinking that the story of two Middle Eastern nudists constitutes a limit for the Earth's geometry. So it's no surprise that being a creationist, you fancy such argumentation. But let me remind you. Science is not a buffet where you can pick out the bits you like and distort the taste with martini. And we all know what happens when you distort too much. Secular researchers are also puzzled by the methane in Titan's atmosphere, because sunlight degrades methane. Titan's atmospheric methane should have been depleted after only a few tens of millions of years, yet methane is still present in Titan's atmosphere. As your friend so eloquently quote mine from that Nature article, energy from the Sun should have converted all traces of methane in Titan's atmosphere into more complex hydrocarbons within 10 to 100 million years. Expectedly, you conveniently forgot to mention the second paragraph, where the article talks about cryovolcanism. At this point, honesty, a trait you apparently lack, requires to point out that the paper cited in the article suggests that geologic features on Titan may be exogenic. Consequently, the methane on Titan would be a short-term phenomenon. And while it may seem trivial to anyone except those who abandoned their critical faculties in favor of the anachronistic literature of Bronze Age warlords, the age of the universe is not constrained by the equivalent of a Eurocoin found on an ancient Greek shipwreck. Commonly, however, Titan is regarded an active world, in some way even Earth-like. Measurements of the isotope ratios by the Huygens probe suggest a replenishment of methane in the atmosphere. As you know, elements come as different isotopes. These are atoms with similar proton count, but a different number of neutrons, and hence different atomic mass. Since the lighter isotopes are more easily lost from the upper atmosphere due to photolysis, the isotope ratio allows for age estimates. The original ratio may reasonably be assumed to be similar to the average fractionation on Earth. The ratio of nitrogen 14 to nitrogen 15 is with 183 plus or minus 5 only 0.67 times that on Earth, and roughly consistent with oxygen 16 to oxygen 18 in carbon monoxide, which amounts to approximately half the terrestrial value. In contrast, the fractionation of carbon-12 to carbon-13 in methane is 82.3 plus or minus 1 and hence very close to the terrestrial value. Since methane does not show the same kind of fractionation as the nitrogen and oxygen isotopes, methane must be either continually or periodically replenished on Titan. Further, the detection of small quantities of argon in Titan's atmosphere provides evidence of outgassing from Titan's interior as argon is produced in the decay of potassium-40 in the core. Conditions during the formation of the Saturnian system could have been cold enough that methane trapped in ice as caltrate hydrate was incorporated into Titan in significant amounts. Maybe the most visible evidence for cryovolcanism is 1500 meter high Sontra Patera, a tall mountain with a crater flanked by finger-like flow features. Sometimes a picture says more than a thousand words. Well, PP, I hope this takes care of your little ailment. Next time you plan to excrete your unparalleled wisdom regarding celestial mechanics, you might make sure to consult the scientific literature and not a toilet pen. 
To demonstrate my point, let's again listen to your audio version of Jake's self-induced mental incontinence. Secular planetary scientists would deny that there's any good reason to believe the universe is young, and yet their puzzlement over these four solar system bodies is a direct result of their insistence that the universe has been in existence for billions of years. If the universe really is just thousands of years old, then evolution is completely discredited. A slow evolutionary process needs billions of years in order even to appear plausible. If evolutionary processes are disqualified, then special creation is the only remaining logical alternative. But special creation requires a creator. And many, even scientists who are supposedly logical, objective, and impartial, are simply unwilling to acknowledge their creator's authority over their lives. Now, I believe to have demonstrated that these secular scientists are not as puzzled as you imply. In fact, if you could have been bothered to put in at least a minimum of honest effort instead of mindlessly parroting your chum's fabrication, you might just have noticed the mountain of research from which I presented the peak. Further, it completely escapes me how Dr. Jake derives a constraint for the age of the universe from the happenings in a solar system that formed 9 billion years after the Big Bang. Either he is completely ignorant about the difference between the universe and the solar system, or his grasp on the ninth commandment is comparable to that of the NSA on privacy. Irrespective of the answer, both possibilities hardly qualify your pal to impart his anal tradition. For all I care, new PP may strap on your blinkers and wallow in the convenience of preconceived absolutism but don't expect any respect for your rectally derived intellectual laziness. Uncertainty is not a weakness, it is the starting point of any investigation. Those who believe that they already know all there is, will not try to find new answers and are doomed to remain ignorant. Leaving the safety of our mental cot may be disconcerting, even frightening, but only thus can we find real answers and there are few greater choice than true understanding. <laughs>